You're listening to a podcast from The Word. I've got a little quiz for you, based on Ooh. an email from one of, our, one of our listeners, Paul Price, inspired by this email. He was pointing out that Charlie Harper of the UK subs had just had his 78th birthday, which does seem absolutely incredible, doesn't it? Charlie Harper, a punk rocker, late 70s, of the UK subs, now 78. And uh, so I, I, I just think it's, it's for some reason, it always seems strange that people who'd had their first hits in the 60s could be the same age as people who, much later on in life, obviously, had had their first hits in the 80s. So I've got uh, written down five people here, and you've got to tell me who of these five is the oldest. It's oh, as right. simple as that, okay? So in groups, there are groups, okay, fine. There are, okay, five, fine. There are five individuals, and you've got to tell okay. me who the oldest is. And it's, okay, number one, Andy Summers of the police. Ooh. Yeah. All right. Debbie Harry. Yeah. Helen Shapiro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is good. This is good. Tony Basil. Oh. It's not oh. easy, is it? It's really Tony not Basil. easy. And the last one is Ralph Hutter. Of Kraftwerk. <laughs> oh, well, so it's Andy God. Summers, Debbie Harry, Helen Shapiro, Tony Basil, Ralph Hood. Who's the oldest? I'm going to take a wild stab because I really don't know. And I'm going to take a wild stab at Debbie Harry. Oh, well, okay. No, she's nearer the bottom end. Oh, really? Okay. I'll give you, I'll give you the, the, the uh, ascending order of ages because there's one year between all of them. Right. Okay. Um, not one year between them. They are between 75 and 79. Ralph Hutter is the youngest. He's 75. Debbie right. Harry's 76. Right. Helen Shapiro is 77. Isn't that uh -huh. amazing? Because her well, first hit was when she was, I don't know, what, 14? Well, so that, that was the big story. 1961. Please don't treat me like a child. Yeah, she was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Pretty big. Right. She was born in 1946. So there yeah. you are. Incredible. Went to school with uh, Mark Bowen. Yeah. Tony Basil is 78. Uh, oh. So how old would she have been when she had when uh, Mickey? Mickey was in about eighty three, wasn't it? Interesting. interesting. Andy Summers is the oldest. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Andy well, seventy nine. I was going. You know, I, I was going to say there are certain of the of that um, of that group that I know that they were started very young, and obviously Helen Shapiro was one, and Andy Summers was very young. Well, he? he was in Zoot Money, wasn't he? Zoot the Money's animals, big roll band, big so yeah, Dan 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 Talion's chariot. Dan Talion's chariot. Dan Talion. Um, oh, that's then. No, that's a good. That's a good game. It's and, not bad. Uh, okay, a yeah. couple of others, just randomly. Ian, I'm just I'm just throwing them in. Ian Hunter is now 83. So that's interesting. Ian Hunter is older than was older than any member of the Beatles. <laughs> so <laughs> Ian Hunter, Ian Hunter, uh, rock stars born. Pre Second World War, presumably. Yeah, he was, well, he was born in yeah June nineteen thirty nine. Okay, so pretty much yeah, a couple, two Amazing. months before. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Lulu is only seventy three. That's astonishing. Can Kate, we, so Kate can we just Pearson? Park for it? Okay, here's this one. Who's the eldest? Out of Kate Pearson of the B fifty twos and Lulu, and the answer is Kate Pearson. Yeah, Kate Pearson is older than Lulu. She's seventy four. Well, yeah, Lulu again started very young here yeah, yeah. when she was 15, yeah. 16. And uh, as, as uh, was back in the um, back in the spotlight last week at the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, wasn't she? Yeah. So, um, with her, uh, with Jenny Agatha. Compare and contrast. I will go no further. Um, <laughs> How old's Pet Clark, Petula Clark? I, do you know, I've been thinking about this the other day. Petula Clark. She's about to be a significant age. She's going with a zero. Well, certain, she's certainly eighty. Yeah, surely. she's no, she's about to be ninety. It's getting me she's about to be. Well, yeah. shall I tell you this? It's really funny. I was thinking about Petula Clark because I, she actually popped up the other day. I've been reading this Bob Hope biography, and um, and she she I think she made a record with Bob Hope really long time ago, and I was not uh, about a year ago or two years ago. I was in. I was in uh, um, Wogan House, as they call it, around the corner from Rockhampton House, uh, waiting to, to to do a kind of down the line interview with local radio, or whatever. And you sit there, you sit there in the waiting room. And there's always people going in and out, you know, to do do little bits and pieces. And um, 
And then, you, and then one of those people who came through, accompanied by a young PR who clearly didn't really know who she was, was Petula Clark. And Fantastic. I was I was really excited. It is his That's that. bloody Petula yeah, yeah, Clark yeah. for crying out loud. You know, Petula Clark, not only, not only of downtown fame, but of, you know, she was a starlet in the late 30s and the 40s, you know, in, in motion pictures, you know. She played, she was a member of the Huggett family and all that kind yeah. of stuff. And she's still going. Still going. I know. So she was about 30, 31, 32 when she had those 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 big hits. Yeah. Which, which of course, at the time seemed fantastically old. But I mean, I wasn't aware of you. We weren't aware of it at all. She didn't look it, you know. Well, she was clearly of a slightly earlier generation, but she kind of got away with it. She never looked as if she was desperately trying to be with the kids. Um, no, she is fantastic, and God, God bless her. What she's about to have her birthday, she? she's going well, not not on November, but she's going uh, to be 90. Good work, wow, well, good That's work, really, really good, very good work, very good work. The Word Podcast Prime Cuts of Popular Culture served fresh each week. So, so why are we talking about Pete Doherty again? Why can somebody explain to me why oh. are we talking about Pete Doherty again? He's uh, he's just uh, released his auto uh, releasing his autobiography, um, which which, which has been written uh, with Simon Spence actually, who did the Marriott book. Right. Okay. And there was a big piece about him, wasn't there? Yesterday in the Guardian by I think Hadley Freeman. Really good yeah, profile. It was... It's fantastic. Which I thought was a very funny, very funny moment in it, where the Guardian, being the Guardian, were quite rightly is saying it seems a bit unfair, really, that uh, this is her. This is her in the piece. Saying, it seems a bit unfair. This guy was so sylph-like and fabulous looking and. Um, whip thin you know um it was put on a couple of pounds you know that it, it, every single headline is all about how uh you know he's, he's he's given up uh he's given up cocaine for cheese you know and i looked went back to the top and looked at the guardian's headline it was <laughs> pete doherty swaps crack for camembert his life in front i thought that's so funny so the subs have just thought well sod that we'll just go for it anyway because it's a really funny line oh dear but i know no, but no my, my i david and i don't know that much about the uh about, about the uh, about the pete doherty oeuvre but it strikes me alex that yeah. a lot of what and certainly the case in this piece that hadley was talking about how Fabulous, he looked, and he did. He looked amazing. When I was at uh, Select Magazine, you know, in the nineteen nineties, you know, he was he was just the major kind of pinup, wasn't he? Just a fabulously beautiful guy. He was. I mean, yeah. he had these big doe eyes and this soft, lovely, lovely soft voice. You know, he's almost like his little kind of pixie. This, yeah, this, this crack pixie. Crack pixie. <laughs> <laughs> and then he had this foil with Carl, who had the most beautiful hair in rock and roll. You know, they, they were amazing. Yeah. It was a, you know, it's a, it's really not about the music. Music's really not about music at all, is it? It's about everything else that surrounds it. It's, it's absolutely. absolutely. And then, listen, we're talking about a similar a similar case this week with Mark Petrus, who's written a book about glam. Yeah. And we couldn't, uh, we couldn't not deal with Mark's specialist subject, which is, of course, Mark Bolan. And Mark Bolan, had a moment, a glorious moment, where he was the most beautiful rock star there had ever been, but it didn't last that moment at all because he'd started drinking too much, and he, he just his look expanded massively, and he suddenly he started looking like somebody who's, who was being viewed in the back of a spoon. He did. And so, he did, and he did, he did, and like never old drag couldn't queen. take. Seriously, anything he did anymore. Well, he 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 was no longer Mark Boland. I, I think there are certain there are other groups. Um, th there are examples of that I think the Lemonheads, Japan, and maybe to some extent Bon Jovi, but certainly the first two are never written about without the majority of that focus being on how beautiful the um, the lead singers of those. Would you categorise Aha in that as well, Morton Harkett, arguably? Yeah, probably, yeah. Yes. Although they're records, yeah. but they're fantastic records that, 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 that kind of survive without any understanding what they look like. But uh, which I don't know if that's true of Japan. You had to see what Japan looked like and see what David saw. I've got a like. confession to make to you, actually, because I used to. I, I was always foremost in. Um, Conditioning out the bad reviews to Japan and David Sylvian. I quite like them now. Small doses. <laughs> they've, they've kind of come towards me via a different kind of um, channel, really, you know. So I, I now hear them as kind of new agey and, you know. Are you talking about the original Japan records? 
Well, you know, the, I'm just the, trying the to get I'm just Japan struggling right. with Japan. the image of you rushing up the stairs to the attic of an evening with a with a glass of rain. I, I don't <laughs> rush. Up, I, I don't rush anywhere. <laughs> and, uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, but but but. Uh, the, the the you know the Pete Doherty uh, Mark Bellen conversation brings me back to my favourite my most treasured theory about rock and roll, which is it, it, it do a pie chart if, with every successful group, now divide it into two qualities, okay, talent and charisma, okay, how much is talent, how much is charisma, you know it. If it's the yeah. Beatles, it's probably 50% talent, 50% charisma. If it's the Bee Gees, it's 95% talent, talent and 5% yeah. charisma. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. If it's the Rolling Stones, it's probably 30% talent, 70% charisma. And I think you, you can apply that lens to absolutely anybody in popular music. I, I, you know, I rest my case. You're listening to The Word Podcast, where the time is... Whenever you want it to be. Yeah, this is a strange coincidence. I've been uh, digging around in the attic looking for old Rolling Stones records, and I found this one. Uh, uh, the American version of the first uh, Yeah, one. England's newest hit makers. That great phrase. And it was so... I was trying to find some news about the Liverpool gig, and I came across the, 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 the site musicnews.com. Genuinely frightful. And I love the way that, that you know, that bands are now described... Uh, via their biggest streaming hit. So do you remember how the old Word Massive, Word magazine, always used to talk, the, talk about the Beatles as being um, uh, the H.J. Hitmakers, the H.J.H., weren't they? Which was the, which was hey Jude the, the Hey Jude Hitmakers. hitmakers you know? And the musicnews.com report about the Rolling Stones thing is about how they uh, cover the first uh, first Beatles, uh, cover the Beatles at the first Liverpool concert in more than 50 years. It says, the Rolling Stones, Stones paid tribute to the Beatles by performing I Want to Be Your Man for the first time since 2012, at the Liverpool concert on Thursday night. So Mick Jagger and co were performing in 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 the Here Comes the Sun Hitmakers home city. <laughs> My god, that's convoluted, time. isn't it? Wow, I know. let's do that yeah. again. The yeah. Here Comes the Sun Sir Mick Hitmakers and Home City. Do it from the top. So Mick Jagger and the Mick Jagger and Co. were, were performing, performing in the Here in Comes, the, the, Here sun comes the Sun Hitmakers home city. Home city. For the first time in more than 50 years at Anfield Stadium, having last played the legendary Empire in 1971. And the painted black hitmakers had a special treat in store for fans. My gosh. I mean, do bands like this even really is... need an introduction? I, I mean, know. no disrespect to, to the Beatles at all, uh, but isn't referring to them as the, the something hitmakers a bit like referring to Take That by the song that Mark Owen sang? But it's just, it's kind of tabloid style, isn't it? Really? It's tabloid yeah. style. It's, it's you, you've always got to introduce a new piece of information in every in every sentence. But also, you've got to put a tag in for people in the very very unlikely event that they don't know who the the, the Beatles are. You know, and here comes the sun is their biggest streaming hit. But it's the it idea is. that they are the here comes the sun hit makers <laughs> is absolutely preposterous. So Neil McCormick, who, who's appeared on, you know, a friend of the pod and uh, has appeared on Word in Your, in your Attic and, and so forth, uh, he uh, wrote right for the Telegraph and he was up there seeing them and he tweeted that the cabbie who'd taken him to Anfield oh, I saw that, yeah. did not know who the Rolling Stones were. No. <laughs> yeah, I thought at first well, of all, maybe they were f- 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 foreign or whatever. Did, I don't they, think they, so. They, no, they're not. They know this guy, he said he was, in his, he was born in the 90s. Yes. But then if he's born in the 90s, then he has to be 23 years old at the youngest. So somebody who's, let's say, 25, it shows you, I think, how much, you know, <clears throat> being able to select your own information sources contributes to people's lack of knowledge. Because, you know, okay, you can't read the newspapers or look at any news sites because in the last 25 years, you would have found out who the Rolling Stones were. And, uh, and if you're selecting everything for yourself, you know, if you're not listening to radio or you're not watching Top of the Pops where you were exposed to a whole lot of things you weren't expecting to hear or see, then the chances are you can remain completely blinkered. So, I mean, did you, do, I, it do, be possible. Do you not know find also that there's loads of things happening in entertainment that you're kind of aware of, but you, you deliberately don't want to know any more about. Yeah. 
I do this absolutely all the time. I know Alex talks about the world of Marvel films and all this. That's a classic case. I know there's a mad, febrile world of Marvel films over there. I'm aware of it. I'm aware mm. it's going on. It's out of my eye line. I'm sorry, I don't wish it to be in my eye line. I can't devote the time to it. Therefore, it's just, it's noises off in my world. And it could be that the Rolling Stones are similarly noises off in the world of a kind of 30-year-old cab driver in Liverpool. No, I understand that. I can understand somebody wanting to block out information about the Rolling Stones. What I can't understand is that he must acknowledge that the Rolling Stones exist. You know, to have not heard of the Rolling Stones is not the same as I don't know anything about them. So oh, so while we're talking about Liverpool, actually, I'm going to I'm going to move this on just a, a little bit. Uh, talk about a very, very famous figure, uh, formerly associated with Liverpool Liverpool Football Club, Michael Owen. Okay? Yeah. And Michael Owen um, endured, you know, massive mockery in the in the digital public square about a year ago when he said he'd only seen about three films in his life. He wasn't interested in films. And everybody said, how could you possibly be like that? And I thought to myself, well, fair enough. If he doesn't want to be interested no, in I films, couldn't agree more. doesn't have to be interested in films. There's no, we're not passing no, a he, test here. He has presumably spent, <laughs> invested his time in other things that were far more uh, interesting and, uh, and educational or whatever. But, but he'd be aware of them. He'd be aware those films exist. He just he hasn't seen them. No, but I thought a load of the film, a load of people sneering at Michael Owen for not having seen The Godfather. They've probably never been to a Premier League football match. You know? Yeah. Alex, oh, yeah, have, that, you, have I, you ever been to a Premier League football match? The the last football match I went to was in the nineties. Right. Then. And uh, yeah, I know. Next, I, I left football. Uh, my my football knowledge. I'm still in the world of David David Seaman and Alan Shearer, and you know, I, I know, I know. Absolutely zero about football, but I know that a few people like it. So you know, and it's and it's a and it's a world yes. that's it's that's quite popular. It's quite popular. But there was this there was this incident a few years ago, wasn't there? When when Kanye collaborated with Paul McCartney, and um, there were all these tweets from Kanye fans going, "Oh, who is this Paul McCartney guy? He's going to have yeah, a really yeah, great yeah. career." From people who yeah. genuinely didn't know who he was. No, I, I bet. I mean, we tend to think the world's binary, don't we? In in in, in the sense that these people exist, and then there was a time when they did not exist. But actually, of course, it's it's much more nuanced and you know just uh, we we all live in echo, echo chambers to a degree don't we and but it's still very very still kind of inexplicable to to think that people don't know who the rolling stones or the beatles are it's like it's almost like somebody saying they don't realize the sun exists in, in a sense except that i think your cab driver would have known who the beatles were i think he was saying it for but, a fact oh, no, if possibly. he's in liverpool you hope so okay possibly if he's in liverpool you know it's because he's a cab driver in liverpool uh, and the other thing is, strenuous efforts have been made in the last 20, 30 years to introduce the Beatles to a young generation. Yeah. And are consistently going on. The same thing does not apply to the Rolling Stones, really, at all. You know, you've got to, you've got to, re, you've got to pump air into these concepts at regular intervals to make them mean anything to, to the new generation of consumers. You know, it's not just heritage that that keeps those things in the air. That's interesting. Sorry, I, wonder just... if, I mean, are the people in there, are, are, the, are the people without their parents, <laughs> late teens or whatever, going to see the Rolling Stones? I wonder. Probably not. What's the average oh, age of somebody in a Rolling Stones concert? I mean, I think Liam Gallagher's quite a good case of that because uh, it seems that there are as many teenagers and people in their 20s going to see him as a solo artist as there are people who were in Britpop the first time around. And... Um, you know he's he's uh, done very very clever things. You know probably not his ideas. Granted, um, like his his latest album cover is he's surrounded by by young fans, for example, to place him in that particular market. Oh, I suppose, really? To make it more palatable to, okay. to a particular generation. But you're right. You know it's um it's repackaging the product to to serve a. Just remind us of the, of the name of the title of his new album, Magic, because I, I, I get the feeling that it's, it's a... possibly the worst title for any record. The least oh, there's fighting talk. Come and on. least colourful. Go on. What is it called? Come on, you know. It's called Come On, You Know. <laughs> Which Dave. is what he signs off all his tweets with. I know. Come on, you know. That's the name 
of the record. I but in a way, I it's, it's perfect. It's, it's just, it's, it's Liam in a box, isn't it? That's all you want from Liam. It is, is to, it's, it's, a kind of, it's a catchphrase, isn't it? It's his catchphrase. You know, the difference just... between Liam and Noel these days is Liam has become double concentrated Liam, whereas Noel has become diluted Noel. And the more Liam becomes concentrated with Liam juice, the more we seem to love him. <laughs> <laughs> it's a beautiful that's thing. Good. That's a very good theory, Alex. That's very good. I like that's that. an excellent yeah. theory. There, so you know, this is the word podcast where you're always you can always get the kind of chemical definition of pop success. <laughs> this podcast was brought to you by the word. <laughs> <laughs>